Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview senior executives by posing the exact questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. This season of Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is an innovative and disruptive company that is changing the way professional investors work. For more information, please visit their site at tegas.co. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Joey Levin, the CEO of IAC Interactive Corp. IAC is a $12.4 billion market cap holding company that has a long history of investing in disruptive digital businesses, helping them grow, and then spinning them off to shareholders. In fact, the company's chairman, Barry Diller, has been influential in the success of a number of well-known public companies, including Expedia, TripAdvisor, and Live Nation. In more recent times, The company has separated from Match Group and spun off Vimeo. Joey Levin has been CEO since 2015 and is tasked with creating value with the remaining group of businesses that IAC either controls or has minority stakes in. With that as the backdrop, I was excited to talk to Joey about spinning off Match, which now has a $35 billion market cap during the tumultuous summer of 2020, what needs to go right with Angie for the stock to be a good investment from here, the investment process and how IAC decides which opportunities to pursue, the merit of the dot dash acquisition of Meredith, and how Joey decides on which companies to spend his time. For full disclosure, Cove Street is not an IAC shareholder. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with IAC Interactive Corp CEO, Joey Levin. As always, we will start this podcast off at a pivotal moment in the company's history, I would like to go back to the spinoff of IAC's stake and match during the summer of 2020. At that time, we were in the throes of COVID uncertainty and match represented a very large portion of IAC's value. Given that match's online dating business model um, depends on people eventually being able to meet in person, was there any concern about the timing of the spin or even the logic of the spin given what was going on in the world? Oh, like everyone in every capacity at that time, we definitely stopped to reconsider uh, all activities that we were doing. So uh, the, the, it was technically a separation from match, not a spin, but uh, so we, we definitely thought about the separation too. And we had a bunch of board meetings and there was, this was a little bit complicated because there was a special match was already a public company. So match had uh, public shareholders, had a board, there was a special committee. And so we were having meetings with them too, throughout that process. Um, And, and we all agreed at at one point, let's just pause for a second and make sure we take stock of what's going on and make sure every people are safe and then make sure that the business and company is financially safe because one of the components of that transaction was there was going to be some debt transferred to uh, match and some, I can't remember if there was new debt created or not. I think there might've been. Uh, and, and so doing all of that, we wanted to make sure everything was, was financially sound. Uh, but very quickly, we were looking at the business, the match business um, and the, the IAC business that was uh, uh, being separated. And uh, IC was going to have a, a, a very cash rich balance sheet. Um, and so that was r- relatively easy. And we were looking at the dynamics of the match business and you're right that, that ultimately people are meeting in person and that's the, the goal of most of the apps. But uh, we were seeing some really, really interesting behavior at match, which was things that we, you know, you'd, you'd never, certainly never wish for a pandemic, but you would have done anything imaginable uh, outside of that to try and get the metrics that we were seeing at match at that point. 
which was incredible engagement among women, incredible stickiness among women, uh, incredible increase in propensity to pay among women, and uh, equal uh, getting closer to equalizing the gender balance in some of the, the, the platforms. And historically in dating in all capacities, whether it's ours or others, they've generally been, there's more eagerness among the male population than the female population. Uh, but what we uh, saw in that period was it, it balancing out. And we had a whole bunch of theses for why that happened. But nonetheless, fundamentally, this underlying metric that you would always hope would, would move in this direction was moving so dramatically in that direction that we knew that well, we certainly believed that the world was coming back to normal at some point. Uh, definitely had the wrong timeline on that, as most people did. But we certainly believed it was coming back to normal. We were making other bets at that point on things going back to normal. And so we saw a view it actually as Matt was in a great place, which is things coming back to normal and some of these underlying things in a, in a, in a much better place. And, uh, uh, we, you know, relatively quickly got to, okay, let's move forward with this and life goes on. And IAC has a long history of either spinning off businesses or, or doing separations like this. But I'm curious about that structure of, of how you decide um, whether or not to retain a stake. So with Match and Vimeo, for example, like, you know, you, you basically either spun or separated from the companies and didn't retain like a, a toehold position or a 20% stake. Like, what is the internal process for determining whether to like, you know, hold on to something for a little while and, you know, maybe continue to ride some of the upside or just let shareholders benefit from it, you know, you know irrespective of IAC? I'm trying to think if there's an example, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. I don't think we've ever held a stake uh, when we've done that. And the reason is because if we are spinning something off, we're spinning it off. We're, we're giving it to our shareholders. And it's not, you know, you say, well, hold on to a stake for, for value or whatever other reason. We, management, shareholders, are the same shareholders. So we are holding a stake. We can hold that stake as long as we want. We just don't have it partially in one pocket and partially in the other pocket. We have it in two separate pockets and can do whatever we want with it. And all shareholders can do whatever they want with it at that point. Uh, but it didn't, we, we haven't seen the logic for doing that. Maybe there's some tax things or uh, others reasons for doing that. Or maybe if you need access to capital or one of the things long-term needs capital or short-term needs capital and doesn't necessarily have another way of, of solving for that capital, you hold on to that so that you can solve a capital need at one or the other uh, later. We've found other solutions for those problems when we've had them. And so that hasn't been necessary. But uh, I, again, I'd go back to if we're spinning, we're spinning, if we're separating, we're separating. And uh, the, the the company should should go off on its own and and succeed or fail uh, uh, on its own. And, and following on that a little bit, we've seen companies spin something off and then it doesn't get the public market reception that they wanted and they try to buy it back. So let's let's take Vimeo, for example. Vimeo's had a little bit of a, a rough time as a public company. Is this, you know, is it in IAC's DNA to try to, you know, buy something back that, that wasn't, you know, getting enough appreciation from the market or, you know, does that seem like a little bit unseemly and not something reputationally wise that that's something the company would consider? I, I, it's impossible to answer generically, and you couldn't answer in, in this case specifically. But is we'd always consider anything uh, uh, if it makes sense. But but I, I guess the only thing I'd say is like it is not a a the driver of us in any on a decision at any given point is going to be, is there a good value? Whether we owned the company previously or not, and can we create value from that point forward? Or whether it traded at X relative to X or Y previously or not, those are completely irrelevant data points. The only data point is, is today, is there a, a good value, an opportunity to create value for shareholders from here based on whatever currency you use to, to uh, pay for something and, and creating that value uh, and value above that over time. Um, and then uh, uh, related, of course, is, is can we, are we, you know, uniquely capable of creating that value and uniquely interested in creating that value? There are things you could buy that just wouldn't be interesting to us or we don't get excited about spending our time motivated. That's usually not a good formula for value creation. Um, 
And uh, uh, so those would be the factors that would drive us more so than any history would, would, would uh, uh, repel us from it or draw it to us. Uh, it, it's, it would be, you know, what, what's happening at the time. I mean, I do think it is less likely that like at the top of our list is things that we've recently spun off is okay. Let's, let's bring those things back in. Um, because there was logic to the spinoff and it wasn't, uh, uh, the stock price at this particular moment in time to, to be the, the driver of that. Um, so, so that I would say that that makes it less likely, but doesn't, eliminate as a possibility. Compounders is brought to you in partnership with Tegas. We created Compounders to uncover the lessons and frameworks of the best capital compounders in the world. And if you are a professional investor, VC, or operator, and you appreciate the deep research into the businesses explored on this podcast, check out tegas.co slash compounders. With Tegas, you can learn about any company directly from former execs, current customers, and industry experts, all of which are in position to offer unique insights into company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. The platform offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies such as Compounders Guests, Viasat, Element Solutions, and Avid Technology. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access to nearly 25,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part, the Tegas collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts that are just as good or better than what you'd find on other networks, but starting at just $300 per call, not the $1,000 or more others charge. If you're ready to go deeper on the next compounding business, head to tegas.co slash compounders for a free trial. I can personally say that having access to the Tegas platform and Rolodex of experts has fundamentally changed the quality of due diligence Coast Street does on both new and existing ideas. So let's dig into all that a little more. Um, You made some interesting comments. So, you know, as an investment management firm, we're always trying to get better, figuring out what to spend our time on. As you know, you can, there are thousands of potential stocks we could look at. Um, but only some of those are going to end up being great investments. So um, if I'm including the cash that Dot Dash used to acquire the Meredith business, looks like IAC has around a billion and a half in cash on the balance sheet that can be put to work in any different areas. So I'm interested in how you guys whittled down that list of investment opportunities when, you know, you just have this really wide mandate and in theory you could invest in just about anything. Yeah, it's the, the, the greatest blessing and the greatest curse or, uh, uh, you know, challenge and opportunity of IAC. Um, and it's why I get excited and everybody gets excited is we, you're right. We can do anything. And we do think about that all the time that, that we can do anything. And I say the curse part of it is you can have a lot of FOMO if you're, uh, if, if anything is possible, well, why did you miss that? You know, why don't we, why didn't we understand that trend was happening or why didn't we understand that, that, that business was, um, uh, uh, you know, had such great potential. And, and, you know, if you're in one area, you're doing ride share or food or whatever you, you're doing, like you definitely want to make sure you don't miss anything in that area. And, and uh, you've got teams of people out there understanding that area fully. And, and if you're doing a good job, you're going to, see all those opportunities and, and make decisions on them. But for us, like, because it's so wide, you can't really boil the ocean. Uh, and so, so we do have to figure out how to prioritize. And there's a lot of components to that. Uh, one is just making sure we're looking in large markets, uh, big enough markets. Number two is making sure we're looking at opportunities of transformation. When there are when there are times of transformation, there's there's usually opportunities for um, value creation. Uh, there's looking at the teams that that um, inspire us. There's and leaders who are ambitious and and you know there's, there's different kinds of entrepreneurs, different kinds of leaders, different kinds of business builders. There are some that are traders, you know, more of the trader mentality who are excellent at that. But that's probably less consistent with what we want to do. You know, when we're looking at, because we're looking at businesses on a forever time horizon, when we get into something, we think about that 
forever time horizon. Like we want somebody who's building the business on that same time horizon and not sort of saying, which is a very common thing among startups, like, okay, here's what we're building and here's our exit plan. I don't ever understand that thing of like, well, well how do you start with an exit plan? Uh, you're, you're not building a business if you're building an exit plan, you're building a, a something else. I don't know what it is if you're not building a business. Uh, and, and so getting aligned on those things uh, and finding areas where we're aligned on those things is important. And we have a, a M&A team uh, of about 10 people that's out there regularly looking at businesses, meeting with businesses. And then uh, we have our existing businesses, which is the greatest source of seeing things happening, seeing things changing, see, seeing opportunity, and then bringing that back to the corporate and saying, okay, here's where we'd, we'd love to deploy capital or here's where we're having trouble and the things might be able to help us solve them. Uh, and then we can really dig in and get capital or get capital against things. And uh, you know, you, you end up being surprised by some of the opportunities or where they come from. You know, it's a lot of that is, is incidental. You're in one business and you think you're getting into another business. We got into dot dash, which was used to be about dot com because we had this whole thesis on a, on a uh, synergy with ask.com, which, never came anywhere near fruition. Uh, but we had this business dot dash and we turned it into something else that's interesting. And I think dot dash Meredith is going to be an incredible field for us for innovation in terms of MA, because each of these areas where we're a publisher, health, beauty, home, food, businesses are going to rise from that, which may start within uh, you know uh, acquisition or synergy with dot dash Meredith, but eventually become you know things on their own. So let's let's stay on the dot dash Meredith deal for a minute. Uh, we looked at Meredith really seriously right before they sold the broadcast TV business, um, and kind of you know we missed it, <laughs> and then and then IAC stepped in afterwards. Um, so for people who aren't familiar with that business, so why just you know and they look at Meredith as well, it's an old school magazine publisher. Why in the world would that be interesting to anyone? What what was so attractive about that, um, and you know why would the perception of a dying you know uh, magazine business be wrong about Meredith? It's a huge digital business buried underneath a magazine business is what appealed to us. Uh, so we had been, I think we mostly told this story publicly already, but we were were I called Meredith multiple times on multiple digital assets that they had. we liked. All Recipes was one that we really wanted. Uh, Health.com was one that we really wanted. There was a few more. And we would call them and say, would you uh, sell us this business? And say, yeah, I don't know, maybe here's the price. And we'd say, oh boy, if we paid that price, then like the, the implication of that price is that like everything else is almost free. And then we'd talk about another one in the same story. So eventually at some point we said, well, how about we just buy the whole thing? And uh, that was believe it or not, an easier transaction to get done than the sort of bits and pieces. Um, and we, we, we looked at it as a publisher, significantly a digital publisher, but publisher period. And then what medium you use to publish is there's all kinds of options. One is the internet and digital and mobile. Uh, another is print magazines, another could be television, another could be podcasts or whatever else. But there's a few key components of that publishing. One big one is brand and trust and brand authority. And they had built that in a number of brands over time. Uh, another one is, is editorial and uh, uh, people capable of writing compelling stories, uh, writing compelling information, taking beautiful pictures, creating beautiful video. That infrastructure is all there. Facilities of, so, you know, they have tens of thousands of square feet of facilities in Des Moines and Birmingham of test facilities to have kitchens. I don't know, there's dozens of kitchens to make recipes and film them. There's uh, uh, facilities to test vacuum cleaners and, and whatever else, uh, it, household equipment. And, all that stuff we said is this is the, the, the building blocks or more than the building blocks because they were already they'd already built it. This is the pieces of a publisher and a digital publisher. And we understand the digital part. The print part isn't a grower and won't be a grower because of all the reasons we, we know about print. Uh, but print is nonetheless a great outlet for for some content at some frequency. People still enjoy reading magazines and certain 
parts of the house or in certain uh, moments in time. And uh, uh, that the, the combination of all of those things was an opportunity for us to take our digital expertise, take our digital publishing, combine it with their digital brands and trust and authority and uh, uh, create an even bigger digital business that happens to have a print uh, outlet, uh, but is not a print business. It's an incredible publisher that happens to publish some component of what they do uh, in print. When you were discussing um, you know, where to put money, one of the things you highlighted, which was, was people, and that's something that's really important to us as well. What do you think you've learned about partnering with the right people? I mean, you say you don't want someone who's a trader who's some building to sell. What are their elements of leadership or skill sets or integrity have you kind of either learned hard lessons about or, or good lessons about over time, uh, over your time at IAC? Candor is the most important. We talk about it all the time. I say it all the time. And I'm reminded of it whenever we bring in someone new, not in the sense that they're, uh, uh, they're default to, to not be candid and transparent, but uh, that they're surprised in the first meeting they have of what candor and transparency means, which is the willingness to challenge others and the willingness to be challenged uh, and, and the willing and, and to, to share your real point of view on uh, uh, a business or a business decision or, or whatever might be on the table. Um, a lot of organizations I've real I, I was lucky, very lucky to have grown up essentially in IAC where this is a, a table stakes, the default. But I realized as we bring people in um, that that is not a default position for most organizations, that things are very scripted, that things are very uh, uh, pre-planned and that the, the disagreements and challenges are unwelcome. Uh, and, and we very much, very much believe the opposite because I don't see how you can get to the right answer without uh, picking a thesis apart and without having smart people who are willing to, to pick a thesis apart. And I think if you look, you find that as a theme among companies that win are the companies that are, are willing to challenge themselves and have people who are comfortable challenging themselves. And under the heading of you know, challenging you and challenging topics, I mean, I think it's really hard to nitpick and find many things that IAC has touched since you became CEO that have not worked but I think one of the ones that's still kind of a work in project uh, progress is Angie. So maybe talk a little bit about the challenges at Angie and, you know, what do you think's holding Angie back from reaching its um, full potential? I don't think it's that hard to, to find things that haven't worked. There's a very, very long list, but I'll go with the Angie question. The, um, I love what Angie is doing right now. And this, it is a good segue of this thing of challenging ourselves. We had a business that was uh, doing well called Home Advisor. Uh, we merged it with Angie's List and that combination was doing well. Uh, but we pushed that business, the, the mistake that we made, we've, we've made a bunch, but the mistake that we made was we pushed that combination too hard and too fast, too early towards uh, uh, profitability. And uh, we, in, in retrospect, first of all, missed a, a big window for investment, but also pushed too many levers in, uh, too hard, I think, that, that, that long-term hurt us. And uh, we said, we're gonna fix that and do everything that's necessary to fix that. And we're gonna do all of that pretty quickly. Um, and I am very happy with all those decisions since, which is to say, we're going to fix these things and fix them as, as quickly as necessary, but they lead to uncertainty in that business of what is possible and, and what, what success will look like and how long success will take and things like that. And uh, there's two main areas where you can think about where, uh, 
how where that sort of investment manifests. One is we said in the merger of Andy's List and Home Advisor, we were maintaining two brands for a very long time, spending hundreds of millions of dollars on branding. And uh, without a real ability for us, even internally, let alone externally, to articulate the difference between the brand and the brand experience. Uh, there's an argument for shelf space, but uh, in the end, we said, if you want to win a category, you're not in the shelf space game. If you want to win a category, you're in a very compelling brand, very compelling consumer experience, and everyone understands what it is and, and, and who you are. And so we combined the two brands. We knew that was going to be a painful uh, combination. A big component of that is the thing called search engine optimization, which is your presence in the big search engines, which is really in the US entirely Google at this point. Uh, but how you show up in, in search engines. Uh, and we, when you change a URL, which is the, the location of a website or the name of the website, when you change the name of a website, you, uh, the, the search engines don't recognize right away who you are and what your history is and what value you provide to consumers. And so they take it down before you go back up. And so we decided we're willing to endure that. Uh, and then also you have to start building this new brand. So we didn't pick one of the two brands. We sort of I'll call it compromised or created something new that we were really excited about and are really excited about called Angie uh, and GI, which dropped the ES and dropped the list and is, a we think, a, a much more memorable word and, but takes a nod from our history. Uh, and we created that new brand and we created that new URL. And now we're in the process of building that back up. That was a very expensive change, but a change that I am very happy that we made. Uh, we could talk about some of the tactics, it's, uh, the mistakes we made in that, uh, uh, change, but that's probably uh, better for a different podcast. Um, the second investment we made, this, the other one was in the leads business, uh, sorry, in the, um, in the services business. So we've always been in the advertising and leads business and advertising and leads just means a, a service professional, a plumber, a roofer, a contractor, electrician comes on our platform and they have uh, multiple ways of accessing a, a, a new customer. They could just do fixed advertising, which is they pay a certain amount a year and, and to be present on our properties and then uh, uh, homeowners find them through there. Uh, or they pay on a per customer basis. So a homeowner comes in and says, I need this job done. And we say, well, here's a service professional for you. And we match them together and, and there's a payment event there. That's been our business for, that was, Angie's List was more in the advertising business and Home Advisor was more in the, the leads business. And we brought those things together and that's been the combined business forever. A few years ago, we said we actually have to innovate this further. And we've been on this path, this vision for a very, very long time, but you have to build all the pieces to get there. And we said, actually, we want the transaction to happen on our platform. And we want that transaction to happen on our platform because it's better for homeowners and it's better for service professionals. The reality is some... Uh, professionals are great at advertising and some professionals are great at getting leads and converting leads. Um, and many professionals are, are great at just doing their profession, which is laying roofs or, or painting walls or, or whatever it might be. And that that's more their passion than the, the marketing piece of it or the salesy piece of it. Uh, and for those professionals, you can bring them uh, a, a job that's ready to go. It's already been paid. Uh, the, the terms are already set, just go and get the job done. And some people really value that. And unequivocally, homeowners definitely value that. If you sit in a room with a bunch of homeowners and you say, okay, here's choice one. Choice one is we'll give you a list of, of uh, service professionals for the job you want done. You can call all of them. You can figure out what they want to charge. You can figure out what their schedule is. You can figure out how to negotiate with all of them and pick the best price and the best one at the best time and get your job done that way. And you can have confidence that you've negotiated the last penny and you've uh, uh, nailed the, whatever the qualifications are, or you can just press this button and get the job done and we'll handle all those things. Uh, and it's pretty easy uh, to, to know that what the homeowner wants is, is the, the latter. And because it's a relatively infrequent purchase, like very few homeowners develop expertise in this area where they could be good at the former. Uh, and so that's where our, our platform can come in and can be helpful and, and can make both sides of that equation much easier 
it's it is a very hard business problem to solve to deliver that service at scale. But we are solving it uh, to the tune of doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue in that now built from nothing. Uh, and we get better at that every day. And that experience we know has a meaningfully higher net promoter score, which is just a judge of customer satisfaction. We have a meaningfully higher net promoter score in that experience than we do in the other experience. And we're going to keep growing that product. Uh, we're investing in it, meaning it's net negative uh, on the PL every day today. Uh, but we continue to grow and scale. And the more you grow and scale, the bigger, uh, the better service we're de- delivering to both sides there. And the more kind of uh, stable the business is with the liquidity in the platform. And I think you have a pretty big vision for what Angie can be. Um, and I want to dig into that idea a little bit. In your conversation with John Boyer, you talked about how you learned from Barry Diller the, the value of thinking bigger. And so I'd love an example, whether it's with Angie or something else of like, like what does that mean? I mean, you're, does that mean you're looking longer term or you just like, you think that, that you think that the business can be far bigger than, than people assume, you know, in, in kind of in the short run, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, how does that actually play out within the investment process? Yeah, I, you can understand. So a great example is, we have this phenomenal tiny business today called Vivian. It used to be called Nursefly and we rebranded it to Vivian a year or so ago. It's in the, um, our vision, the founder's vision for it is to be a, uh, the, the default destination in uh, job placements in healthcare, which we think is a wide open opportunity. Uh, Today, it is in the travel, most significantly in the travel nurse segment, which you may not realize that I didn't realize this until we were into this business or we're getting into this business. But travel nursing is a huge segment or a subsegment of nursing where nurses go to get uh, three month, six month jobs as travel nurses in another uh, location. It's a great uh, uh, business. It's a great category, but it's small. There's not that many travel nurses and and that's a good business for um for would be a good business for a lot of people it's just for ic to move the needle if you're just in the travel nursing business that's probably not a huge business for ic if we were getting into that to say okay we want to be in the travel nursing business we probably wouldn't bother because because of what i just said but our vision there is no we see transforming healthcare hiring and uh if we can transform healthcare hiring that is a a big enough opportunity for us. And so when you're thinking every day about how to build that business and, and who to hire and what to invest in and, and all the different pieces of what's possible there, uh, you're thinking towards, okay, I, I know I need to nail this trail and thing which we're doing, but how am I laying the groundwork for these other things to, to get to that huge, you know, what could be a tens of billions of dollar market and tens of billions of dollar business revenue opportunity how are you building towards that or laying the early groundwork towards that while you're, you're nailing this other thing? And I think that that, that framework is, is really important to building biz, big businesses of, of saying, we're not going to be satisfied. We're not going to be happy with building this small business. Every business gets built one brick at a time and one step at a time. And so all of our businesses are very, very small until they're big. Uh, but nonetheless, thinking about and building towards what is possible and not being satisfied until you're, you're not really ever being satisfied, but not being satisfied until you're, you're going towards that bigger thing and making progress towards that bigger thing is, a, I do believe, a really important, crucial step in building huge businesses. And so far, we've discussed nursing, you know, print magazines, um, you know, home services, you, like myself, are kind of a generalist and you have to know a lot about a lot of different things. So I'm interested within that. I mean, you wear a lot of hats you know, when it comes to your roles at MGM or AC or Match or Angie. I'm interested in how you structure your day and your time and, and, and prioritize given how many different um, you know, companies that, you, that you're involved with on a given ba- day basis. The key in all of it is do, do we have great people all around IAC in, in every field. The people who run their businesses have uh, both 
incredible knowledge in their business, incredible passion for their business, and uh, uh, have incredible incentives in their business uh, to, to grow those things. And that is a, the, the system doesn't work without all those components. So it, in any, you pick any one of the IC businesses, there's a leader of that business who knows about a thousand times more about that category and what's going on there uh, than I do. And, uh, and, and the same is true, by the way, of, of, um, of sort of more administrative functions, you know, to get, make this whole thing work. We know we have to have the, the best controller and we know we have to have the best um, uh, treasurer and we know we have to have the best tax people so that the people who are building those businesses who know who are building the business in nursing or the business in, in publishing know that they can focus on those things and somebody's got their back on, on tax and treasury and accounting and whatever else in ways where they'll, they'll not have to worry about it. Having those people be expert and paying uh, the, the exceptional uh, rates for the best people in those areas uh, and giving the people the, the freedom to operate in those areas is key to the whole thing scaling. Uh, but to get to your more specific question, uh, it really depends. The, the, the sort of my day or my week really depends on on what's going on. Sometimes we're in the middle of a deal, and that's taken up a huge amount of time in a given day. Uh, sometimes we're in the middle of some kind of crisis, and that's taking up a huge amount of time in a given day. But generally, the rhythm is we're meeting with each business depending on its size or scale or growth stage or crisis stage. Uh, on a weekly or any range goes from weekly to monthly basis. And uh, in those meetings, it's, I think, I, I like to believe that we are holding ourselves, our businesses and ourselves more accountable than the, than most other uh, uh, formats are capable of like a, uh, uh, more than a sort of public company board can hold a, a, a management team accountable or more than a, a private company board can hold a, a team accountable because we've seen a lot of what's going on. We're deep in the numbers. We have access to all the numbers. We're deep in the metrics and we're, we're in regular communication and goes back to candor and transparency with the team where we can have the conversations very honestly, and then we can take action very quickly on what's working and what's not, what needs more capital, what needs less capital, what needs changes, and we can affect those changes uh, very, very quickly. That focus on transparency um, really resonates with me and, and, and you know, how the right way to, to, to have it to formulate an investment process. And, and within that, I always like to ask people about errors of omission because outside investors rarely get a glimpse into paths not taken. I'm interested if there's any, any swings that you really wish you would have taken over the last five or six years that, that you didn't take and, and maybe talk a little bit about why, you know, you know, what, what, when originally what, what held you back and what you missed. There's a bunch of them. Uh, and those are definitely our, our biggest mistakes. Um, and I could talk about specific companies or we close so we didn't get there. Uh, uh, there's a bunch that you feel look through the retrospectoscope where, where truly horrible decisions uh, misses. Um, but if I was going to go a little bit more generically, I'd say one thing I regret that we still haven't done, didn't do then. And we've talked about and still haven't done is um, consider an, a organized focus on uh uh, minority investment or using minority investment capital. Uh, I still, our focus has been and remains and should remain um, majority investment in things. But I think if we were organized for it, as opposed to sort of happenstance, if we were organized for uh, uh, taking advantage of the IAC pipeline, which is incredible in this area, to uh, systematically do uh, um, minority investments to stay current on a bunch of things that's going on and, and um, uh, use that as a, a, uh, a feeder in a sense for what are other opportunities available for IC or majority opportunities available for IC. 
I think uh, we could have created uh, a lot more opportunities for ourselves and been in a lot more uh, interesting places. It, it, again, it doesn't mean taking ISC's balance sheet and spreading it out very thin across a lot of things, which I don't think is a good idea, but organizing a pool of capital specifically for the purpose of uh, minority investments in areas where you take advantage of the ISC pipeline, I think is a thing we could have done uh, with our capital or others that, that could have created some opportunity for us if we go back and think about that pipeline and what we've uh, uh, done and not done, that is uh, uh, an opportunity. Interesting. So it's almost like having an analyst team like 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 we do, just people looking at public stocks all the time. Yeah, I mean, I don't think about public. I think about more privates as, it, okay. as more interesting there. I think there's there's one game that's that one not game, but one strategy that's that's new for us that's worked is we are willing to make minority investments in things when it's big enough to matter. Uh, where there's real scale uh, in, in it for IEC. So when we made the investment in MGM, even though we were a 12% shareholder, it was a billion dollars of capital, which a billion dollars is, it would have been one of the biggest businesses and just our stake would have been one of the biggest businesses in IEC at the time. Uh, and and that, that, I think that's not really what I was referring to before, nor would Turo be an example of that. When, when we invested $250 million in Turo, that was also a big business for IEC, that $250 million. And uh, in both cases, we're the biggest shareholder. In both cases, we spend a lot of time with the business trying to help in any ways that we can possibly help uh, and, and supporting what are very, very capable uh, uh, leaders and teams there. Uh, that... That I think about differently. I'm talking about more like very uh, uh, past minority investments, but much, much earlier stage things where we can start to see things that are 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 brewing and and use our pipeline to to execute against them, which would have a much higher failure rate, but uh, a a bigger exposure to to newer opportunities. Interesting. Um, and so we're, we're we're just about out of time, but we're going to close with our uh, favorite question, the one we close every episode with is. What do you think is the most misunderstood or underappreciated aspect of or, or business within the IAC portfolio that people should be paying a lot of attention to? Um, well, I feel like it, to, a bit of a broken record as, as it relates to a, a misunderstood concept is or, or just underappreciated concept. And even I've underappreciated because I've so taken it for granted is the the, the, the the culture of candor and transparency here and how important that is. But uh, underappreciated business is I we we alluded to Vivian and we have a similar business in the light industrial space called Blue Crew. This is going to be both of these will be long term uh, investments. There's a lot of there's a long while before there's something that meaningfully moves the needle in in these businesses, but. I believe we're in categories that are ripe for transformation uh, in there. And I believe that the, the one thing we say sometimes is that, that the future is obvious in these categories of where we're matching workers with employers on using software as a basis for matching, um, which is much better at using people, frankly, as a basis for matching. Uh, in those areas, I think there are categories being absolutely transformed, and uh, I hope our businesses are a meaningful part of that tr transformation. And if we're right, they're in huge, huge uh, uh, addressable markets that would be appealing. Well, Joey, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate hearing all about your insights of, uh, and the, of you giving your time at IAC. So thanks so much for being on the show, and good luck with everything. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at co-street capital.com with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibiker.